YouTube, we could not be, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Hello world. <laughs> we, we are live now. Oh, wow. Excellent. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll jump in first then. Thanks for putting us live, Jack. Um, hello, people watching. Welcome to our fifth Back from the Brink talk. Um, by now, I think we've, we've probably got some of the same people that are coming to our talks um, every time, um, in which case I'm going to call you the Brinklets, our audience. <laughs> um, I am delighted to introduce today Bobby Hemmings. Bobby is currently studying a Master's in Ecology and she set up um, an Instagram channel uh, a couple of years ago to share her learning journey about bees and insects. And she just wants to spread the world, word and get people on board. So I am delighted to introduce Bobby. Hello everyone, um, let me just get my slides up and then we'll get cracking on. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, there we go. Uh, James, can you just let me know when you can see it? That's okay. Um, okay, James, can you see that? I can see that, yeah, yeah we're good. Brilliant. Okay, fabulous. So hello everyone. Yeah, as James said, I'm Bobby. Um, I like to be called Bobs. Um, and I'm going to be taking you on a bit of a journey today into the wonderful and wacky lifestyles that bees have. Um, and it's okay if you don't know a lot about bees and if you know quite a bit, because I'm going to strip everyone back to basics. They're all at the same level. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some solitary bees, some bumblebees, uh, their life cycles, the habitats that they have, and some cool facts too. And I'm also going to tell you how you can start out looking at bees. Because um, it can be quite daunting when you start. Um, they're a very diverse group. So I'm going to give you some hints on tips on that. And also how you can help as well. Because there's a lot of doom and gloom going around in the news at the moment. But I'm going to give you some little tips that you can use in your garden. So let's get cracking. Okay, so firstly, what bees are there? I think it's a really, really good first thing to do is differentiate between a solitary bee and a social bee. Um, so a social bee, that's made up of our bumblebees and our honeybees. And they live within colonies. So this is made up of a queen bee, some female workers, and then some males as well. Um, and they produce honey. And they have a sense of eusociality. So eusociality basically means the highest level of organization. Um, so I don't really understand why we don't let bees run the country because they do a great job. Um, and then you've got your solitary bees. And this basically means the loners. So a female will create her own nest, um, lay her eggs with it, and that is, that is complete. There's no other bees involved in that scenario apart from another male. Um, so our solitary bees actually make up the majority of the bees in the UK. We have over 250 species. Um, but it can be confusing because solitary bees choose to nest all in the same place. So sometimes if you go across a nest site, it can seem that there's lots and lots of bees swarming, um, but they still are solitary. And I'll discuss uh, some of the species with you as we go on through the presentation. Um, and also just to confuse you even more, um, there's a type of bee called a sweat bee. Yep, it eats on sweat, yummy. Um, and this can range from being social to solitary to semi-social, um, so there is some overlap too, but I think just for now, it's good to just distinguish between social bees and solitary bees. Okay, and before we get cracking as well, I thought I'd go through some of the common tricksters. So a lot of the time, um, people come to me with a picture and say, what's this bee? And often it's a hoverfly. Um, but you know, don't feel bad. These are the wannabes, quite literally. Um, they use a mechanism called mimicry. And this basically means that an animal or organism will resemble or take on an appearance of another animal in order to avoid predation and blend in. So basically the hoverfly takes on a bee's appearance and it's like predators, well, I've got a sting, don't touch me. So it, there's a reason why they're really hard to identify. Um, but a really good tip to ID a hoverfly rather than a bee is to look at the eyes. So as you can see where I put the arrow there, on top of the head, they're really protruding, whereas bees have them on the side of their head. Um, and also they lack hairs because they don't collect pollen. Um, so a good tip for that is just to look at the hairs on the legs. If there's no present, then it's a fly. And also their flight pattern as well. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across a hoverfly, but sometimes 
they can really like stare you out. They'll be hovering right in front of you and darting back and forth, whereas bees don't tend to do this. So that's another trick for you as well. Okay, so the sawflies, um, these are a really weird group, um, but I like to kind of differentiate them because they're quite long and gangly. And also on their wings, they have really, really indented veins, whereas bees don't have that so much. And then the bee flies. So yes, it has bee in the name, but it's not a bee. These are actually parasites of bees. So that long tongue you can see, that's called a proboscis. And what happens is the bee fly will hover over the solitary bee nest and flick its eggs into their nest. So really, really cheeky. Um, but again, their flight pattern is quite different to a bee. It's very skittish, flitting back and forth. Um, and again, they don't have hairs on their legs either. And then the wasps. Yeah, a bugbear of many, many people, but they are a great predator. They help to regulate our ecosystems. Um, and they also are pollinators as well, which surprises a lot of people, I think. Um, but the way to tell a wasp is they have a really obvious joining, um, joining of the waist there, which you can see on the picture. And they also lack hairs as well because they don't tend to collect pollen. So yeah, these are our common tricksters. They're still super duper important. They still pollinate. So we still need to protect them as well. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing on our bees. So I hope you can see that, but I'm going to be taking you on a bit of a solitary bee journey. And I think it's good for you to know kind of what you're going to see as the seasons go on throughout the year, because different bees emerge at different times. Um, and I just thought I'd talk you through a basic life cycle, which most of them follow. Um, so you've got an idea of why they nest in certain areas, et cetera. So typically between March and June, again, this varies on the species. Some adult solitary bees will emerge from their nest and they'll start finding mates. So it's kind of like a huge bee orgy. Um, I hope that's appropriate to say, but it's true. Uh, the females will then get to work on her nest. And again, this differs depending on the species, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, she then kind of lays her eggs within the nest and she goes out and forages for some pollen and nectar. And she kind of creates a little pack lunch um, and she pops that in with her eggs and then she seals it up with sort of natural materials to protect it from predators or harsh weathers. Um, so yeah, mom goals. And a really, really clever thing with bees as well is the fact that she can choose the sex of her eggs. So if she fertilizes an egg, it will become a female. And if she doesn't, it becomes a male. So then what happens is she lays the eggs and they start to um, turn into larvae. They then spin a cocoon and emerge as adult bees in the following spring. So this happens uh, majority of the time uh, once a year, but sometimes there can be two generations depending on if the year's good, if there's enough resources, the weather and that sort of thing. So as I said, I'm going to talk to you about lots of different species, but that's kind of the general cycle that happens. OK, so throughout the slides as well, I thought I'd give you some flowers that are really, really good for our pollinators, um, really nectar rich and pollen rich too. And you can probably notice that a lot of them are blues and purples. And there's actually a reason for this. And um, this is because bees can see in the ultraviolet spectrum. So bee vision is made up of three color receptors. They've got UV, they've got blue, and they've got green. Um, so basically, they can mainly see the purples and the blues most clearly. Um, but again, it does have to have a really rich nectar and pollen source, otherwise they won't bother. Um, and I'm, not, I'm also not saying that they won't go for the colour flowers, because they do. Um, it just seems to be that they do go for these colours as well. So yeah, let's talk about the spring bees. OK, so mining bees. Um, if you ever see a scientific name, and the beginning of it is Andrina, that's the genus. That means that it's a mining bee. And the clues in the name, they nest within the ground, usually within sort of soft, sandy soils. Um, and I've got a picture at the bottom just to show you what their nest sites look like. And these two beautiful, beautiful solitary bees, two of my favourites actually, um, they've just started to emerge. And if you go down your local park or within your gardens, you'll probably start seeing the females creating some nests. And what they do is they dig, 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 dig in the soil. And then the process starts to happen where they lay their eggs and collect pollen and nectar as well. Um, so the ashy mining bee, um, as with most bees, the females are always larger. And this is because they lay the eggs and they kind of do most of the work. They create the nest, etc. cetera. Um, but they tend to like bare patches of soil, um, managed lawns, flower beds. So you'll often see these guys in your garden. 
Um, and then the tawny mining bee, she has a beautiful, beautiful coloration. And this is where I kind of want to talk to you about some basic bee anatomy. So you've got the head of the bee, you've then got the, th the thorax just after the head, and then joining onto the thorax is the abdomen. So within the female there, you can see she's got a beautiful fiery orange thorax and then a kind of orange striped abdomen. And she is my favorite bee, she's just so, so beautiful. Um, and these guys love to feed off gooseberry flowers. Um, and I've seen a lot of them on dandelions as well lately. So keep your dandelions. Okay, so the cutest name award goes to this bee, 100%, the hairy footed flower bee. So I captured both of these bees uh, in my nan's garden two years ago. Beautiful, beautiful bees. And I like to use this as an example of sexual dimorphism. So it sounds really complicated, but all that means is that two sexes of the same species have different appearances. So it's not just their sexual organs that differ, they differ in coloration um, and different physical traits, just like we do as humans. Um, but the reason they kind of, they kind of resemble a bumblebee and they actually have a really high pitched pitch buzz as well, but they're not bumblebees, they are solitary bees. And they tend to nest in sort of soft clays, mortar, when you see them between sort of March and June time. Um, but their flight is kind of very skittish as well, which is a good way to differentiate them from a bumblebee. Uh, they kind of flip back and forth as well. Um, so they're kind of less clumsy, clumsy than bumblebees, kind of like what I like to say. Um, and a really cool fact with the males in this species is that they have their really hairy legs, so hence the name. And this is kind of used during mating to massage the female. Um, and this is still being researched. They're not really sure why. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like a really experimental uh, thing during mating. And bees tend to have a lot of these experimental uh, processes that I'll talk to you about. So a good tip for him is he has kind of a white moustache on the, on the front there, kind of like white facial hairs, um, and then like a gingery body. And then the female, she's all black and she has some orange hind legs to collect her pollen as well. So yeah, one of my favorite bees purely because of the name as well. Okay, so the cuckoo nomada species. So um, cuckoo basically in the animal kingdom refers to parasite. They have sort of specialized behaviors, specialized um, physical appearances, which enable them to carry out their parasitic behavior. Um, and these are kleptoparasite, which basically means they do absolutely no work, they enter the solitary bee's nest, seal all the pollen and nectar resources, lay their eggs, and then their larvae will actually eat the host eggs as well. So it's quite a savage world, the, the bee world. Um, but they're host specific, so they tend to go for a specific solitary bee species. And they have this really, really, really clever way. And the males can sort of leave scents over certain holes to tell the females this is a good one to parasitize. They sort of help the females out, which I think is really, really clever. Um, they have a really good olfactory sense, which means they can pick up on pheromones, different scents. Um, but they kind of look quite waspish, I think. But a good way to tell um, with them is they have usually orange antennae and orange legs. Um, and they lack scopa as well, which is the pollen collecting apparatus that bees have on their legs. And I think sometimes when we talk of parasites, it can be quite a negative thing. But I think it's good to remember that a parasite isn't always a bad thing. Yes, it's bad for the bee that it's parasitizing, but it regulates the natural host population sizes. So that's all, always worth bearing in mind. Okay, I know this is a favorite of many people um, because it's quite a regular visitor to people's gardens, but the leaf cutter bees, and the clues in the name kind of always is with these bee names, um, but they have specialized mandibles, which is kind of like the, the bee teeth, I like to call them, at the front of the bee. Um, they chew through petals and leaves, and then they use this plug their nest hole. So you'll often find them nesting in your bee hotels. Um, and also if you have roses in your gardens, uh, often the holes found in your roses will be from these guys because they, they just have this thing about roses that they love to use it to plug their nest cells. Um, and the way they collect pollen as well, if you can see the picture on the bottom left there, you can just see some orange coloration um, and hairs underneath her abdomen. And that is the way they collect pollen. So that's called a pollen brush in this species. Um, and if you've ever watched a leaf cutter actually collect pollen, it's really, really funny. They kind of look like they're twerking and they kind of like wiggle their bum on the flower. Um, so it's really, really funny to watch. But these are really common, like I said, and they fly from sort of May time. But other than your bee hotels, they do like to nest within kind of hollow stems of plants. 
um, soil and deadwood, so it can vary as well. And then on the top right there, that's a common Willoughby's leaf cutter, um, and that's a male. And the way you can tell that it's a male is it has white boxing gloves, is what I like to call it. And again, these are used during mating. And what they do is they secrete some chemicals and they also cover the female's eyes during mating. Again, really experimental these bees. Um, <laughs> still unsure why, but they know that they secrete some sort of chemical that helps with um, mating. So really, really interesting. Okay, so our summer emerges. Um, here's some really good plants again for your garden, so make note. Uh, lavender smells beautiful. And I always think as well, uh, in the summer, it's good to provide bees with a water source. So a really simple trick to do this is to get Tupperware, fill it with lots of pebbles, lots of different rocks. So it's kind of full to the brim of rocks and then fill it up with water. Um, this makes sure that if a bee comes to have a drink, that they don't fall in and drown because Sadly, that's quite often in bird baths and paddling pools. Um, so make sure they've got a way they can get in and get out. But I think it's, it's common to forget that bees actually do need to drink, just like other insects as well. So that's just a quick tip for your uh, garden in summer. Sorry, I don't know why it's doing that. Bear with me. <laughs> we love technology. Um, sorry, guys. Okay, the red mason bee. So there's lots of different mason bee species in the UK, but I thought I'd talk about the red mason bee because it's kind of the most common one that you're gonna see in your gardens. Um, and they get their name because they like to use mud to seal off their nests. And they also nest in sort of mortar or cracks and crevices within bricks as well. Um, and they do this really clever tactic where they lay their male eggs at the beginning of the nest, at the start of the nest, so that they can emerge first and then wait for the females to come out. So they kind of just go and mate with them, like crap on, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but they are also common residents of your bee hotels as well. And a really good IT, ID tip for these guys is they have really, really long curved antennae. Um, and the female is just on the bottom right there. And she can often be kind of mistaken for a tawny mining bee, which is the bee we saw at the start of the slides. Um, but a good way to, make sure you're getting the right bee is to look at the thorax because you can see she has sort of a blonde ashy appearance on her thorax whereas the tawny mining bee has the fiery orange one um, but it's quite funny actually last summer uh, me and my dad had some nesting in our ventilation bricks just above his house um, and honestly they will choose anywhere their heart desires if they like the hole they will go in it uh, and I've heard a lot of people have them nesting in hose pipes as well much to their dismay Okay, the plaster bees. Uh, one of my favorite bees, I think I say that about all of them, but I do like these ones. Um, and the females actually have specialized saliva, which brings a rise uh, their plaster in name. And they use this to line the walls of their nest cells. And the reason being, it's actually fungi resistant, bacteria resistant and waterproof. And this protects their eggs from all sorts of harsh conditions, from predators, um, it kind of sounds like I'm advertising some sort of bee product, you know, <laughs> like fungi resistant, bacteria resistant, but you know, it's really, really cool. Um, and that's one that I took a picture of on the right, a female making her nest, such a gorgeous little bee. And they really like soft, sandy soils, just like the mining bees. So again, another confusion. They are different bees, but they still mine. Uh, and the different, different between the mining bees and these bees is the fact they have that specialized saliva. Um, but they're sort of adapted to feed from flowers, heather and daisies as well. And a good way to ID them is they have a really gingery thorax, quite short antennae and a really stripy abdomen. So you can see that just in the left bottom picture there as well. So yeah, beautiful, beautiful bee. Okay, the small scissor bee. So as you can see, <laughs> they're small. The smallest UK bee species we have. Um, as you can see, I'm holding one on my finger at the bottom there on the right. And when I first found out that this was a bee, I was absolutely mind blown. I did not know that bees could be this small. Um, and this bee is also known as the harebell carpenter bee. And the reason being is they spend a lot of time in harebell campanula flowers. Um, and they're oligolectic, which means that they specialize in collecting in this type of flower. So they collect only one type of uh, flowers, nectar and pollen. Um, but within this flower, they spend a lot of time there 
Um, so if you ever have these flowers in your garden during summer, take a peek in and you'll probably find them all aggregated together. Um, they sleep in there, they feed from the pollen, they feed from the nectar, they mate in there. So it all happens in this flower. It's kind of like a little bee club. Um, but they, do, they don't nest in there. They don't create their nest in this flower. They actually nest in old beetle holes within dead wood usually. Um, and that's why they think they've got the really small, long, slender abdomen there, because it, it's adapted for them to come in and out of those beetle holes. So yeah, really sweet bees. Okay, uh, the sharp-tailed bees, they are quite savage. Uh, another kleptoparasite, but as you can see, the shape of their abdomen is pretty much resembling a sword. And the reason being is they use this to kind of poke through solitary bee uh, holes that they've plugged up. They poke it through and then they lay their eggs in there. So a kind of really savage way to uh, parasitize a bee. But the males have spines on the tip of their ab abdomen as well. So the males don't obviously lay the eggs, but they use that to uh, kind of ward off any of the bees or predators. Um, and we actually have eight species here in the UK. And I'm yet to see one. I really, really want to see one. So if you've seen one, please send me a photo because I'd love to see one uh, in the wild. But they don't just parasitize leaf cutters. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. They also parasitize the mason bees and the hairy footed flower bees as well that we've seen. So yeah, really cool bee. I think I say that about all of them, but they're just also cool. Um, okay, the wool carder bee. So they nest pretty much anywhere. Uh, they do tend to go for hollow stems within plants. But the way to tell these guys is they have yellow markings uh, down their abdomen. So they're kind of like wasp-like. The abdomen looks quite waspy. Um, but in this species, the males are actually larger than the females. And it's because they're actually quite aggressive, uh, not to humans, to other predators, the bee. And they have spines all the way down. And they use this again to crush intruders, so often bumblebees. And they kind of charge at them as well. So they are quite aggressive. And they also guard plants as well, uh, ready to mate with the females. But the reason they get their name cardavi is because they actually comb uh, woolly kind of fibers from plants. So uh, if you've got lambs here in your garden, you'll probably see these bees combing away, uh, which they then use to make their nest. And it's kind of like a spherical nest. So it fits with the carder name. So yeah. Okay, so autumn. Um, most bees are flying throughout autumn. Um, but the ones that are emerging are what I'll talk about in a minute. And here's some really, really lovely plants that you can plant. So honeysuckle is gorgeous. And vervain, uh, it not only gets you lots of bees, it also keeps away vampires. So it's a win-win, guys. Get some vervain in your garden. Okay, so the ivy bees. Um, these are a type of plaster bee, but they deserve their own slide because they're really, really cool. They're actually a new bee. Sorry, this is going to be full of bee puns, I do apologise. Um, <laughs> they're kind of like a new bee amongst the UK solitary bees. Um, they were first found in 2001 in the UK. They're so really, really recent, really. Um, and as I said, they're part of the plaster group. So they do have that specialised saliva, which they use to line their walls with. Um, but we actually, when we moved into our student house here, it, it was just meant to be. I mean, I got here in September and the lawn was absolutely covered in ivy bees nesting and carrying out different behaviours. Um, one of the behaviours actually is called a mating ball, which you can see on the top right of the slide there. And this basically is all the males come and gather and roll around one singular female. I feel so sorry for her. Um, but it's really funny because the males just end up getting tangled in each other and it doesn't really lead to anything. <laughs> and only one male gets to mate with her. So. Uh, it's just really, really funny to watch. And my housemate will vouch for me. I was literally sat on the lawn for hours with a cup of tea just watching them. I think they're so fascinating. Um, but the reason they're called ivy bees, because they feed on flowering ivy. Um, they're oligolectic as well. So that means that they specialise in collecting nectar and pollen from a specific plant. And in this case, that's ivy. So yeah, they're quite late flyers. Um, again, they nest underground in lawns, but they're not a mining bee. They're a plaster bee. So what actually happens in winter? Um, I get asked this question a lot. Well, first of all, I get really severe withdrawal symptoms because there's no bees around. Um, but most solitary bee nests are sealed up with the larvae and the pollen and the snacks to go. Um, but over winter, that will hatch and a larvae will develop, spin a cocoon and develop into young bees ready for, to emerge in spring. 
Um, but an adult solitary bee life cycle is so short, it's only a few weeks to months, which is really, really sad, really, because they do so much in this short amount of time. Um, but yeah, like, and another reason as well is because in the winter, it's too cold for bees to fly often. So um, they actually regulate their heat from external heat, so the sun. So often you'll see bees sat on leaves, uh, sat on grass, warming themselves up. And that is because they have to warm up their flight muscles ready to fly. Um, so in winter, this is really difficult for them to do. So yeah. Okay, now let's talk about the bumblebees. Um, so again, these are a social species and their colony size can range from sort of 50 to 400 individuals. But again, that depends on the species. And they're kind of characterized as our round fuzzy bees, aren't they? Um, and the term to bumble about means to be clumsy. And I think that really describes a bee's flight pattern, a bumblebee's flight pattern, you know? <laughs> they just look like they shouldn't fly, but they should. And uh, they're all over the place. Um, but they do produce honey as well. I think that's a common misconception. It's, it's not the honey that we all know. It's not the honey that honeybees make, but it's a honey-like substance kind of like a nectary sugary solution. Um, but as I said, not to the extent that honeybees do. And um, we have 25 species here in the UK, so quite a diverse group. Okay, so let's kind of talk about the bumblebee life cycle. Uh, so I'm gonna talk you through with the numbers because it's uh, kind of easier for you to follow and easy for me to remember as well. Um, so what happens is number one, a queen bumblebee has been hibernating over the winter alone. And in spring, she will emerge from a little hole in the ground and she'll go off, she'll forage and look for a suitable nest site, depending on species, um, ready to lay her eggs. So number two, she'll go and collect pollen and nectar for her as well. And then number three, she can actually secrete, secrete some specialised wax from specialised glands within her body. And this is what she uses to lay her eggs. So it's really, really clever. And then the really clever next thing, which is number four, she actually creates a nectar pot that she makes out of wax and fills it up with nectar. And as she's sat on her uh, eggs, warming them up, she shivers to warm them up and incubate them. She sits there sipping out of her nectar cocktail. And I just think that's such a <laughs> funny vision to have, you know, this queen bee with her cocktail. I think it's really, really cool. Um, so she sat there shivering, incubating their eggs. Uh, and number five, they then hatch and they start consuming the nectar and pollen that she's um, collected for them. And they start to develop into larvae, spin into cocoons, and then develop into adult female workers. So five and six, that's kind of like early summer time. Uh, the female workers hatch, like I said, and they've got lots of different jobs. So uh, usually the smaller bees will carry out sort of cleaning duties in the nest, um, clearing away debris. And then the larger ones will go out and forage to collect the pollen and the nectar for the nest. Um, and the queen does not leave. She lives up to her ruler uh, position and she just stays there ordering them around and laying her eggs as well. And then seven, uh, in the late summer, nests will start to produce some new queens ready for the next season um, and also the males as well. So the males have only just been um, sort of born and hatched and they don't collect any pollen. They simply just stay alive, uh, go and collect nests for themselves and they mate with the queen bee, as you can see in step seven there. Okay, and then new queens have obviously developed during that time. Um, so they will leave the nest when they've been feeding heavily during hibernation, feeding on lots of nectar, lots of pollen. Um, they will leave as the old nest dies. And then you start the cycle again and they go and find a place to hibernate over the winter. So a really, really cool life cycle, which bees are just incredible, you know, how she can make her own nectar pot, like that just, wows me so much. Um, but a really cool bee. Okay, and some really cool facts about bees as well. Um, so my bee hero, Dave Golson, if you're listening, hello. Um, <laughs> he's a bumblebee expert and researcher. And he found that bumblebees actually have bumblebee footprints. So they have their own scent, uh, which he likes to call a chemical bouquet, which I think is a beautiful word for that. Um, and they have their own scent that tells other bees that they've been to a flower. So as a bee sort of flying around, they pick up these scents and they can tell whether a flower is rewarding in terms of nectar. Does it have nectar? Has a bee already been? Um, what type of species it is? So it's really, really clever. They can, you know, pick up all this information just from a smell. Um, and another way actually they can do this is they can detect electrical signals. So 
just simply from picking up certain signals from atmospheric electricity, they know that a bee has been to that flower. Like how insane is that? Um, and even more to blow you away, they can detect temperature. So a bee knows the cooler and the hotter part of the flower. And this again also helps them to um, assess what flower it is as well and what species of flower it is. So, so, so clever. Um, and if you actually have a patch of flowers in your garden that you keep tending every year, and it's really nectar and pollen rich, you're probably getting the same bumblebees every day because they just tend to go to the same patch every day. You know, it saves them energy, it saves them time spending forage for other flowers. So you end up with your own little bee family. And I just think that's amazing. Um, and buzz pollination. So 9% of our world flowers actually rely on this. Um, and this is where bumblebees actually vibrate their flight muscles and it dislodges the pollen um, and naturally pollinates. So they kind of like shake and twerk and this uh, pollinates the flower. And then in colder temperatures, um, bumblebees actually have to uh, get their flight muscles up to at least 30 degrees, uh, which seems crazy, but you know, they have to do a lot of shivering to get to that point um, before lift off, which is quite a high temperature really. Okay, so the carder bees. Um, so again, the name carder sort of comes from how they nest. Um, they kind of gather dry grass and moss and kind of create a spherical nest. Um, and I've just got three species here. There's a lot more, um, but obviously I can't talk about all of them today, sadly. Um, but the shrill carder bee is actually quite a rare and threatened bee. And I know back from the brink I've been doing a two year recovery project for these guys, which is really, really cool. Go team. Um, but they're really threatened by intense farming. So um, a lot of their habitats, nest sites, and pollen and nectar sources have been cleared away for agriculture, sadly. Um, but this project is really great. They're working with landowners and training people to monitor them. So there is hope. So really, really cool. Well done, guys. Um, so the moss card will be there. She's in the middle, uh, a really fluffy, blonde and gingery bee. Um, they are monandrous. So that means the queen in that species will only mate with one male. Um, and this actually can cause trouble within a nest because if you only mate with one male, you're increasing your chances of inbreeding because bees are technically all related. Um, but they have a really cool way, the queen has a really cool way to detect her level of relatedness to the other bees in the nest. Um, she can pick up scents, so it's actually thought that, that she can just tell which bee she should mate with, depending on the genes as well. So if they couldn't get any cooler, I mean. Um, but the shrill carder bee, uh, just to mention that the reason they have that name is because they have a really high pitched buzz. It's really, really uh, distinguishable. Um, and in carder bees, they tend to have uh, darker pollen baskets. And I like to think of pollen baskets as sort of like hippie pants because um, it's kind of like a big ball of pollen on the side of their legs. Um, so in this species, they really have darker ones. Okay. So the red tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius, I like to think of kind of bumblebee names as sort of Harry Potter spells. I just think, you know, it just sounds really, really uh, clever and cool. Um, and just to mention as well, uh, Bombus is the term for bumblebee. So if you see a scientific name and the genus part of the name, the first uh, word is Bombus, that means bumblebee. So the queens usually like to nest in old smart, small mammal nests. So bees tend to use um, nests that have already been used, just saves them a lot of time and energy. Um, so they start their colony there. And I like to really notice in this species the difference between the male and female. Like in that picture, you can see how much bigger the female, uh, there she is with the black hairs and the red tail, um, how much bigger she is compared to the male. It's just fascinating to watch them mate, honestly. You get to see it, it's such a cool sight. Um, but they're a really, really efficient pollinator. And this is because they have a medium sized tongue, proboscis, which they use to collect the uh, nectar and pollen. Um, and I like to call it the Goldilocks proboscis because it's just right. And that, that means they can go to a, lots and lots of different flowers, a different range of flowers, um, and it just makes them a really efficient pollinator. Um, and another cool fact about these ones is the males fly really, really high into treetops often um, and secrete their sex pheromones everywhere. Sounds lovely, I know. Um, and this is because higher up, there's more wind and they'll transmit everywhere. Um, and there's something really cool about these pheromones as well, is the fact that they are species specific. So when they're putting out these pheromones, um, they're making sure 
that another bumblebee species won't come and try and mate with them. Um, so it'll be specific to the red-tailed bumblebee. Uh, and another really cheeky behaviour in these bees as well is the workers will sometimes eat the queen's eggs, much to her dismay. Um, and Free in 1969 did a study on this, and he actually found that queens will bite and headbutt the worker bees if she kind of suspects them trying to eat the eggs. Um, so she kind of rules out the troublemakers. Um, but much to her dismay, they do end up eating a lot of the eggs, sadly. Um, but this is only kind of if there's like a shortage of food resources and things. Um, but yeah, I think that's quite funny. Okay, the tree bumblebee. So they do get their name because they like to nest high up uh, in old bird boxes usually, or uh, like crevices and cavities within trees. Um, and we actually had them over summer nesting in above our bathroom. And it's really, really funny because they do this thing called bee chatter. And it literally sounds like they're just chattering to each other. And it's really, really high pitched squeaks. And it's just them communicating to each other within the nest. Um, but I know that the Bumblebee Conservation Trust end up getting a lot of complaints about this um, because they tend to do it in antisocial hours, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, really cool to listen to. Um, and the way you can ID these guys is they have a gingery thorax and then they have the white tail um, on their abdomen. That's the way you can distinguish them. And they also perform this behavior called nest surveillance and lecking. So this basically is males will get into a big, big cloud outside of a nest um, and they will wait there and wait for a queen to come out so they can mate with her. Um, and this can go on for weeks and weeks and they can just leave and come back to the cloud. Um, and it's a really funny behavior to watch. Um, but yeah, that's the way that they can make sure that they spread their genes um, and get to mate with the queen. Um, so if you've got an unused bird box in your garden, um, a good way to tell if you've got bumblebees is to look for some yellow splodges on the outside of the nest box. So you can actually see some on that picture there. And this is basically bee poo. And I think people forget that they do poo and it's yellow because they drink nectar. Um, so that's a good way to spot uh, if you've got bumblebees as well. Okay, so the early bumblebee, she's an early emerger, hence her name, makes sense. Um, and only in COVID times did I use a mask to save uh, an early bumblebee not too long ago. And it was unused, I've got to say. Um, but yeah, the, I like to call the males in this species the Pikachus. Um, if you've watched Pokemon, you know what Pokemon is. Um, because they have really, really bright yellow facial hair. Um, these are such beautiful, colourful bees. They have um, yellow bands, really bright yellow bands, and then an orange tail. They're really, really colourful. And they're a really important pollinator of our soft fruits, including raspberries and blackberries. Um, and they actually um, do this really cheeky behaviour because bees seem to do this um, called nectar robbing. And this has been, this is kind of commonly seen in a lot of species, but I know this one particularly. And they will actually not carry out their job of pollination. Um, they kind of get lazy. And what they do is they'll go to a flower, bite into the base of the flower and drink the nectar without touching any of the reproductive parts of the plant. So not doing their job, not doing the pollination. Um, and exploiting their relationship with plants, which I think is so funny. And if bees all learn to do this, we are screwed. Um, <laughs> but I just think it's really funny. Okay, so the buff tail bumblebee, uh, that's the queen there on the top. So she has the buff tail. And you'll probably see these actually still flying about now. Yeah, you should, should be able to see them now. Um, and she'll be looking for her nest site. So she's really large with the buff tail. And then the workers actually resemble another species that I haven't got on these slides today called the white-tailed bumblebee, uh, which is on the bottom there. So they look really, really similar and they're often quite hard to uh, distinguish. But within this species, um, aloethism is seen. And again, this is found by Golson. Um, and this basically means that within the bee, they have different sized thoraxes. Um, so after the head, the thorax. Um, and this means that they carry out different behaviors within the nest. So, like I said earlier, actually, you know, the smaller bees will probably stay in the nest and help with cleaning. And then the larger bees will go out and forage for pollen and nectar um, because they've got kind of more chance of survival um, and, you know, the harsh weathers that England throws at them. Um, but these are often used as well in greenhouse pollination, so our agriculture. So if you really, really like tomatoes, you've got these guys to thank um, because they are often used in that pollination. Um, and queens will emerge in spring and the female workers in early summer and the males late summer. So it follows that cycle that I was talking about earlier. 
and they also have a tendency to be cheeky and participate in that nectar robbing behavior as well. Okay, so again, like with the solitary bees, there are cuckoo bumblebees. So again, that means that they parasitize other bumblebee species. Um, and it's a similar sort of lifestyle. So they're really, really sneaky. They will crawl into a bumblebee nest, hide amongst the debris, and they can sort of like mask themselves in a chemical scent, which is really similar to the queen. So the workers have no idea that they're an imposter. Um, and what happens is they kill the host queen, and it's really, really savage, kill the host queen, and then she controls the workers. And this can be behavioral manipulation, so she can be quite aggressive to the workers, or she'll use that chemical mask and scent to disguise as another bee. So incredibly specialized and really, really clever. Um, and they sort of resemble as well the bumblebee that they're parasitizing. So you can probably see the Bombus rupestris there. Um, they actually parasitize the red-tailed bumblebee. And you can see they're quite hard to differentiate. So they're not only fooling the workers, they're fooling us as well. Um, but yeah, and I also like to uh, kind of say as well, this is a personal observation, but in cookie bumblebees, their banding is usually a lot more obvious than it is in other bumblebees as well because they like have sort of that less fuzzy appearance because they don't collect pollen. So that's a little tip for you there. Okay, bumblebee mites. I think these are really, really clever, really cool and really funny. Uh, and these mites are called Paracetellus bucorum. That's their scientific name. And they are not harmful to the bee. That's a common misconception. Um, and I mean, if you've ever seen a bumblebee with mites, it does look like it's not very comfortable for the bee. Um, but here's a queen bomber specialist that I actually picked up a year ago, and she was absolutely covered in mites. Um, and it's, they're not harming the bee, they're not eating away at the bee, but if there's too many on her, she finds it difficult to fly because they just become, make her too heavy to fly. Um, and it's kind of like a cheeky taxi service is what I like to uh, resemble it to, because what happens is a bee will visit a flower and the mites will sort of hop on for a ride back to the nest. And within the nest, they then kind of decompose the nest debris, uh, all the kind of feces in there and things. And then they jump back on the bee, back to the flower, ready to get onto another taxi, another bee, and go to a different nest. So it's just a really cheeky and funny way to exploit bees. I just think it's so, so clever. Um, and if you ever see one, uh, a bee infested with mites, it's really, really like crazy to see. Um, and if you can, get a soft child's paintbrush if the bee is struggling to fly and just brush them off gently um, and hopefully she'll be able to fly again because that's what happened with this queen bomber specialist here. Yeah. Okay, so now I've sort of talked about the bees, I want to tell you how you can get into ID and bees because a lot of people ask me, where do you start? Um, this is a really difficult group, you know, they're really diverse, there's so many different colorations, <laughs> different species, um, you know, where to start? And I just want to firstly say, don't be afraid to be wrong. You know, you're going to be learning all the time. I still get things wrong all the time. Um, you know, I always check in with experts and think, oh, you know, have I got this bee right? Um, but, you know, I think as adults, we do forget that it's okay to be wrong. As children, we're always, always learning, always making mistakes, and that's okay. So it's fine now. Um, but a simple tip I like to give you is that when you first start out, Look what's in your garden. You know what bees are inhabiting your garden, visiting your plants. And see if you can tell, are they solitary? Are they bumblebees? Are they social? Are they solitary? Are they, um, what colors do they have? Are they large? Are they females? Are they queens? You know, just give yourself a simple task first, make some notes of the coloration. And then I'd head to get an ID guide. So you can purchase quite a few. Um, there's an FSC BioLinks one that's really, really good. I've got it stuck up all over my room. Um, it's quite cheap as well, so that's a really good one. But there's a lot of free stuff out there as well. There's loads of free resources you can get. Um, I know the Bumblebee Conservation Trust have an app, which is really clever. Um, you've got RSPB with lots of different resources. Um, and I don't know if you know entomologist Stephen Falk, uh, but he's on Twitter and he has a really, really great Flickr page, which is full and full of photos. Um, of different bees and lots of descriptions of them as well, which is really, really good to use if you're first starting out. Um, but yeah, just remember that looking at them is the fun part. Don't make it stressful. Don't make it, you know, a thing that you're scared to do. Just reach out to people and they will help you. 
and social media. Um, you know, I know it gets a lot of um, kind of negativity, but I found social media so, so helpful during my career so far. Um, I've got some really great connections because of Twitter, Instagram, um, and there's such a brilliant, brilliant community on there. Um, if you post a picture of a bee and ask, please can someone help me? People will, they are happy to help you. Um, don't be shy, just post it out there um, and tag a few people. You're always welcome to tag me. Um, I know it's a bit of a plug, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> please feel free to follow me on Instagram um, and I will try and help you as best as I can. And if I don't know, which I'm happy to be honest, I don't always know, I will direct you to somebody that I do think uh, can help you. Um, and also on Facebook as well, there's the Bees, Wasps, Ants recording scheme. Um, and they're really, really ID experts. They're brilliant. Um, so if you join their group, you can request to join it, um, post a picture in there and they can help you as well. Um, but as I said, always happy to direct you. So just pop it my way and I'll take you down an avenue that I think is good. Oh, my screen keeps doing that. I don't know why. It'll work eventually. Sorry, guys. There we go. So why do we actually need to help bees? You know, I haven't actually said that yet. Um, but they provide a vital ecosystem service. They are our pollinators. They pollinate our wild plants and trees and also a lot of our crops as well. So we rely on them a hell of a lot. Um, and also their food for other organisms. You know, they're part of a food web, a food chain. If you take that away, other organisms are going to suffer as well. Um, and also they're so awesome and so cool. Uh, I feel like we have a duty to protect them because they're just amazing little things. Um, and here's some of the threats that they are currently facing. Sorry for the doom and gloom this afternoon. Um, but climate change, you know, bees are very weather dependent. Um, and I think as weather changes, temperature changes, it'll be really interesting to see how they adapt um, to that climate. And then pesticide use, sadly. Um, and, you know, farmers do use pesticides, but, you know, I think there's a lot of demand on farmers and it's not always their fault because, you know, supermarkets are asking us create the perfect crops we are always demanding more um, so it's really difficult for them to not use pesticides a lot of the time um, and then intense agriculture and also like land clearance to create housing you know that strips a lot of great habitat for bees um, and also where their nectar and pollen sources are as well so yeah it's a lot of bad things that are going on uh, that are affecting our bees but to move away from the doom and gloom I'm going to give you a couple of tips on how you can make your garden be friendly and get support in our bees. So first of all, is keep your garden wild. Uh, if any of you follow me on, on social media, you'll see me literally going on about this all the way through spring. Um, and there's a reason because dandelions, and I know there's a lot of people that would refer to as a dandelion as a weed, but personally, I think there's no such thing as a weed. It's purely a wildflower that's in the wrong place according to humans. Um, but dandelions are such vital food sources for bees. Um, often when I actually, you know, pick up a bee that's needing an energy boost, I pop it on a dandelion and the jobs are good and they're good to go. Um, so please, please, please refrain from mowing your lawn as much as you can. Um, if you follow Simon Leather, um, he's an entomological professor on Twitter. He's done a really, really great blog about this, um, where it's kind of talking about how twice, twice a year is enough. Um, so please go and check that out and leave your wildflowers, please, um, because they don't just help bees. They help beetles, butterflies, uh, wasps, all the lovely bugs that help us pollinate our planet. So say no to the mo. That's my hashtag. Um, but yes, please create an insect friendly patch. So some of the flowers that I've talked about, uh, if you plant it, they will come. Maybe leave like a deadwood patch in your garden, you know, because some of the species that we've discussed like to nest in those kind of habitats um, and also a water source. Um, so the pebble bath that I mentioned earlier as well. And then create nesting sites. Um, so you can buy bee hotels um, through our kind of leaf cutter bees, mason bees, but I would suggest actually making your own because um, it's a cheaper and simpler way to do it. And all you can do is get a log and drill some holes in and often they will come. Uh, there's lots of websites and things to talk about like the, the depth that you need to drill. So make sure you check that out first. Um, and also if you're, if you're using bamboo, so a lot of time people will actually kind of roll up a load of bamboo. So it's like lots of different holes for them to nest in. Please, please make sure that you replace those every couple of years. Um, I think 
there's a tendency to leave these kind of things to their own devices, which does make sense with nature a lot of the time. Um, but sadly, mold gets in there, parasites end up in there, and also predators like spiders. Um, so yeah, make sure you change them every couple of years. Um, and a tip as well is to keep your bee hotel facing southward um, and three feet off the ground as well. So, you know, there's enough distance off the ground for bees. Um, make sure it's fixed so it's not blowing in the wind because that will put them off and it's not covered by vegetation either because they need the sun to penetrate quite hard on the, the hotel. Um, and as I said as well, leave like dead plant material because they like to nest in those kind of areas too. Okay, and raise awareness as well. Let's shout it for the people at the back, how awesome bees are. You know, if you've learned something today, which I really, really hope you have, um, please teach others about it. Teach your family, teach your friends, tell everyone, because the more we look, the more fascinated we become and the more we're likely to protect um, and conserve our animals and our bees and our insects. Um, and you can sign or create your own petitions, like, you know, get ballsy, get making a petition. If you don't like the fact that your council is mowing in your park, tell them, you know, be nice about it and tell them and educate them and bring them on board with trying to conserve our species. Um, and write into your local MP even as well. It's a really good way to try and bring about change. Um, and also joining charities, you know, NGOs, non-government organisations, because a lot of the time they really, really rely on your funding to carry out the really crucial conservation work. So RSPB, um, Wildlife Trust, they all do really, really cool stuff like this. Um, and I know there's a lot more that I haven't mentioned, like BTO and Bumblebee Conservation Trust as well. Um, so yeah, get on board with all of those people. Um, and yeah, I know that's been a whistle-stop tour um, throughout kind of the life cycles of our bees in the UK. Um, and I know you can ask some questions now, I've got a bit of time, but if you didn't want to, or you're shy, or you don't want to now, please, please feel free to email me on bobby.hemmings2 at gmail.com. And also follow me on my social media, if you like, on Twitter, it's Bob's Bee Hunt, and on Instagram, it's Bob underscore Bee Hunt as well. So yeah. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's been interesting and you've learned some stuff. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming. That was so good. Like, there's so much info in that. Like, I, I, my mind's a little bit blown. <laughs> <laughs> like, I knew a tiny bit about bees already, but yeah, that was really incredible. And also, <laughs> before we go to the questions, your slides are the best slides I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I found these um, little bee illustrations on PowerPoint, which it was just, they're so funny, some of them. I just yeah. really wanted to incorporate them as much as I could. They're so good. Right, we're going to head into the questions now. So if anyone's got one that they really want to ask, pop it in the chat now. We're going to go through them in order and hopefully answer every question. So get your questions out. Right, let's have a look at the first one. Hey, Jack, can I, can I jump in first? Do we yeah. get priority? Of course. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm. When you're talking about the bumblebee mite, mm -hmm. um, is that one specific species of mite? Yeah, it's specialised to particularly parasitise bumblebees. So so clever. And That's like I said, a cheeky taxi service. That's what I like to describe them as. Because I, I always assumed when I saw a bumblebee with mites, I'd be like, oh, there is no way of ever knowing what the mite is. There's probably hundreds of species that do things like that. So. And now I know there's only one species. I can I can make a biological record out of that. I can submit a record about. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. I mean, there probably are other mites within the nest, but I think that's kind of the one that, that you know hitches the ride and latches onto the bee. I think it is just that species, the Parasitellus fucorum. You know, the fancy Harry Potter name. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's 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 made my day. I'm going to go try and record a bumblebee mite in the next few months. <laughs> that's a tick. <laughs> bad. Um, cool. Here's the first question from the chat. <clears throat> and you kind of answered this, but there's a little bit of extra to it. So how many types of bee are there? And uh, but this is the extra bit. Um, how many of them are rare or threatened at the moment? Do you do you know? Okay, well, I know that a lot of them are becoming increasingly endangered as we clear habitats, um, you know, the intense farming that I said. Um, but I think Andrina, the mining species, they seem to do really well at this time of year. I've seen lots and lots in my park. Um, I know that doesn't mean a large scale thing, but um, I'm going to say I don't know exactly on that question. Um, but all I need, all I know, is that we need to help them 
desperately because I know insects are probably in decline. Uh, yeah, and there's over 250 species is the answer to the first part of the question. Yeah, it's incredible how many there are really, isn't it? That you just... Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, here's the next question. Sorry, I'm not as well organised as I usually am. Ah, here's a, here's a really good one from Lisa. And you, you sort of scratched the surface on this one, but I think lots of people would like to know um, any specific resources you have that you might recommend. So they're asking what, what stuff you would recommend, websites, books, and things like that. Okay, yeah, so um, I did mention the FSC Biolinks uh, guide, and it's really cheap to buy. I think that's a really good visual uh, ID guide that you can take out with you. Um, so I definitely recommend that one. Um, the Collins British Guide of Insects, that's really good as well because it's got lots of photographs. Because sometimes I think illustrations can be difficult to tell. Um, so I think photographs are a really good way. Um, and as I said, Stephen Falk's Flickr is absolutely incredible. It's got all the bees on there. And he also gives you some descriptions as well next to um, the pictures. Um, but yeah, and the Bumblebee Conservation Trip app as well, you know, so you can go outside and take your phone with you. A really cool way to do it. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, I have a, um, I have one of those kind of fold out um, laminated yeah. sheets. I really like those. Yeah. Uh, and they're quite basic. You know, there's not that many species on, but to get you started, they're really good. I think. Yeah, I was going to say for starting out, that's brilliant. And I think Bug Life have one as well which is really good. Yeah, nice. Um, okay, here's a good one. Um, is it unusual to have new bees colonise the UK? I think it is, yeah. I would say so. I think that's why the plaster bee, the ivy bee, is so kind of um, popular because it only got here in 2001. Like, that's insane. Um, I think, yeah, I'd say it is unusual. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah do, do you think... Um, do you think there's likely going to be more that colonise here? Is it is climate change shifts temperatures? What, what do you think? Do you, do you have you heard anything about that? Or I haven't heard anything, but personally, I think if temperatures do change, I think the bees will definitely adapt to that and have to fly further for certain resources or temperatures. So yeah, it's definitely. I wouldn't, you know, put it out of the question for sure. Yeah. That's a personal opinion. I can't say like off research or anything. Yeah, yeah. Am I right in thinking that the the tree bumblebee is one that's colonised in the last twenty years or so as well? I remember everyone being very excited about tree bumblebees. Yes, I believe they're one of the more recent bumbles. Yeah, um, to come into the UK, definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> hmm. um, here's an ID one, and I. This is tough. I mean, I I struggle with IDing all sorts of stuff because there's often quite a lot of variation, isn't there? I mean, yeah. loads of different species. But um, how do you distinguish between the buff tail and the white tailed bumblebee? Like, have you got any like telltale things that you can give us tips? Um, this is really difficult, and you kind of need to be really up close to the bee um, to see. But I think the banding is slightly different, and I always struggle with this. Um, so I'm going to have to say you'll have to research a bit more into that. Um, but I think on the buff tail, there is more of like a buffish tinge, if that makes sense. Um, the queen is more obviously buff tail, but within the workers, I think there is a slight tinge as well, just um, on the abdomen. So, yeah, it's really difficult. I think a good tip for that is to really look at pictures online and really kind of zoom in and have a look. Yeah, like really scrutinise them. Yeah, because <laughs> honestly, some of them as well, like the mining bees and the Andrina species, uh, some actually require like microscopic analysis to tell which species it's really really difficult it doesn't make it easier for any of us really <laughs> yeah maybe maybe the uh lay person will just leave that species just yeah. focus on other stuff <laughs> <laughs> or, or fact, out, yeah. <laughs> maybe this is the best time of year to be recording your buff tail and white tail because it's it's queen season now isn't it with that obvious yeah, the buff, buff or white tail, and then later in the year you just give up and ignore them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, here's a cool one. This is from Joel. When bee larvae go into their cocoons, is it more like beetle larvae molting into adults, or more like caterpillars effectively dissolving and then becoming butterflies? Wow, that is a really good question. Thanks, Joel. Hi. Um, <laughs> I would say it's probably more like beetle. Um, they kind of go through that larvae and then they just 
it's kind of like they look like white mush is what I like to call them <laughs> and then you start to see the bee sort of shape developing um they kind of they're all white and then they have like these really weird pale eye eyes so I would say it's more like the beetle transformation rather than caterpillar to butterfly right really interesting I hadn't, to be honest, I hadn't actually thought how you got new bees. I thought, oh yeah, they lay eggs and then there's a bee. <laughs> I hadn't thought of the process. I was thinking of, because I suppose in like a chicken egg, you can't see into it, can you? Yeah. So it's just like, oh, the eggs lay and then the chick comes out. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> no, I like that one. That was my favourite. Yeah, it's a good one. I like that. You've got the mind of a, um, you know, like a inquisitive, you know, like children. I don't mean yeah. that in an offensive way. No, definitely. Um, <laughs> um, I've got, actually, you know what? I've got my question. So my um, my mum's partner is really into his lawn, like super, super into his lawn. He likes lines, mowed very, very regularly. He just bought a new mower and he really loves <laughs> his mower, right? Oh. What would you <laughs> say to him? to leave like a wild patch or like not mow a certain area or something? What would be your like way of convincing you? I think just to break it in, you know, maybe if he can't commit to the whole lawn, um, is there a section that he is willing to give up uh, to keep wild, you know, just starting off small? And then maybe he'll see all the different pollinators come in and I'll be like, wow, this is so cool. Like let's leave the whole of the lawn. <laughs> um, and I suppose, does he know a lot about bees? Does he know a lot about pollinators? I think the more you educate people, the more willing they are likely to, you know, leave it alone more. Yeah. yeah. And maybe avoid the dandelions, you know, like kind of skirt around them as you go. <laughs> <laughs> leave little dandelion patches. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I'll be able to convince him that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he bought a, he bought an electric mower and it doesn't do the whole lawn without charging. So maybe if I can just say, look, do what you can in one charge. Yeah, that's like yeah. a convenient. Break them in, break them in, or cut the cord. No, I'm joking. Don't do that. Cut the cord. <laughs> um, okay, here's another real question from the real question from the chat. <clears throat> do you have any suggestions for particular plant genuses to attract rare bee species? That's mm. quite specific. Ooh, that's a good question. Mm. Um, I really recommend getting some Campanula species in your garden. Uh, purely so you can see the small scissor bee in action because it's so so cute like just watching them all aggregate in this flower, like carrying out their mating, like sleeping, really, really cool. Um, Lungwort is a really good one for hairy-footed flower bees. They absolutely love it. Um, nettles often, the flower in nettles, really good for bumblebees. Um, lavender, absolutely love it. <laughs> Get lots of different species on that. Um, but yeah, I think other slides going to be on YouTube afterwards because I think they'll be able to see the different flowers in there as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, I, I once read that um, loose strife, there's a loose strife mining bee. I don't, I don't know if it ever comes into gardens, but I don't know if, if, if you've got a pond or something, some loose strife might bring in loose strife bee. Oh, I've never heard of that one, so I'm going to have to look that up as soon as I get off this. Uh, I love to learn about my bees. <laughs> That'll be my job tonight. Look cool. at that one. And I lavender. It's so yeah. easy to grow. Like, yeah, and it smells great as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as I said, you know, I'm still always learning. You know, I only started this two years ago. And, you know, just that's my advice to anyone is just keep keep at it, keep learning, and don't afraid to be wrong um, yeah. because there's always so much more to learn. Yeah. Um, here's a fun one from Archie. Apart from bees, what's your favourite insect? Oh, <laughs> that's a nice one. Yeah. Ooh. What's my favorite? I'd say moths. I think they're just amazing. Like the diversity of their coloration is amazing. Definitely moths. And their feathery antennae as well. Someone's, um, someone's just said that maybe I need to call parts of the lawn meadow margin or a bee border. Yeah, I think, it, I think yeah. the, lawn need, the lawn needs a rebrand. Definitely. Get a little picket fence and everything around it and make it like your bee garden. Yeah, <laughs> make really it your own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's all the questions at the moment. Yeah. James, have you got any other questions? I know you're oh, into your um, You've put me on the spot there. Um, I mean, um, I, a, a contribution is that I once went on a course led by Stephen Fork uh, about bee identification, and 
he's amazing. His Twitter's mm. fantastic. His um, Flickr and the guides on there are absolutely amazing. Yeah. It, it really makes you realise for a lot of species how closely you need to look uh, and yes quite a lot of them quite a number of them are microscope jobs though with a photograph you can get most of them down to a, a genus um, mm -hmm. so that's just a reflection uh, on, on on what we've talked about oh actually I do have a question now I've thought about it the wall yeah. cardaby okay the wall cardaby I get the name because uh, yeah. carding is the process of pro, pro yeah, yeah pulling process wool yeah okay yeah. wool carder bee I get it why is the carder bumblebee called wool. carder then so I know that in the moss carder bee particularly they like to collect and comb dry grass and moss in sort of the same way um, and I think their nests are as well are quite spherical in shape so kind of like as you're kind of pulling into a wool ball um, so I think that's why um, yeah I think that's why. <laughs> ah, right. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Because as we were talking about the wool carnaby, I was like, that name makes perfect sense, and I had no idea why the bumblebee was called it. So that's that. And considering that we've been Jack and I have been working on shrill carnaby, I get the shrill bit. Never really thought about the card a bit until this moment. Mm. Yeah, no, it's crazy actually because you just kind of think of it. Oh, that's its name. But then when you actually look into the meaning, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Someone actually did come up with a useful name for us, but. <laughs> Amazing. I just don't ask questions, James. You tell me. <laughs> tell me the project's called this, the bees call this. And I'm just like, oh, I'm in. <laughs> um, brilliant. Well, that's all the questions. So um, thanks to everyone who's come to this event and yeah, watched it. Um, I'm sure you enjoyed it. I thought it was amazing. Thanks thank to you. everyone who asked all the questions. Um, we have other talks coming up in this series. Uh, they're on all kinds of things still. We've got one on how to identify absolutely anything. Wow. We've got another one that's uh, on the connection between art and nature, which will be really great. So check those out. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, and then other than that, thanks again for coming. And it's bye from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's bye from me. Am I even popping up on camera? Am I a disembodied voice? You are. <laughs> That's so creepy. Okay, I said so bye from me as well, Brinklets. <laughs> Brinklets. And yeah, thanks from, from me as well. Thanks for staying on and hopefully you've enjoyed it. And yeah, save the bees, people. Save the bees. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everyone. See you Thank later. You. Bye.